Have you ever wondered what the Bible says about the end of the Antichrist? Today we're going to explore one of the most dramatic prophecies in the Bible, the final moments of the Antichrist. This prophecy unfolds in the book of Revelation, where it is foretold that the Antichrist after a seven-year tribulation period, will gather nations to wage a war against Christ. This epic battle is often referred to as the War of Armageddon. However, despite the Antichrist's attempts to prevail, it is prophesied that Christ himself will descend to earth, and with a mere breath he will overthrow the Antichrist and his false prophets. This cataclysmic event marks not only the end of the Antichrist's reign, but also the beginning of a new era of righteousness. Intrigued? Let's dive deeper into the Book of Revelation to understand these events better. The Book of Revelation opens with a striking image, a man riding a white horse called Faithful and True. This is no ordinary rider, this figure is none other than Christ himself, symbolized in the most majestic way. The white horse he rides is a symbol of victory, purity, and righteousness, a fitting mount for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But let's delve deeper into the imagery. This rider, Christ, is not only mounted on a white horse, but he also carries with him a sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. This sword represents the Word of God, a weapon far more powerful than any physical blade. It is a tool of judgment, a decisive instrument that cuts through deception and lays bare the truth. Contrast this with another rider on a white horse, the Antichrist. The Antichrist, too, is a figure of power and authority, but his tools are different. He carries a bow without arrows, symbolizing a false promise of peace, a deception that lures people away from the truth. The Antichrist's power is not in righteousness or truth, but in deceit and manipulation. The distinction between these two riders is stark, and it is crucial to understand. Christ, the Word of God, faithful and true, rides forth with the power of truth and righteousness. The Antichrist, on the other hand, wields power through deceit and manipulation. One brings salvation, the other destruction. But Christ does not ride alone. Following him are the armies of heaven clothed in white, representing the saints who were raptured and those who were killed for believing in Christ. These are the faithful, the true believers, who stand with Christ. They are clothed in white, symbolizing their purity and righteousness, and they follow Christ into the final battle, ready to stand against the forces of the Antichrist. In the end, the symbolism of the white horse and its rider paints a clear picture of the struggle between good and evil, truth and deception, Christ and the Antichrist. It is a vivid reminder of the power of faith, the importance of truth, and the ultimate victory of righteousness over deceit. An angel standing in the sun calls for the birds to gather for the supper of the great God. This striking imagery from the book of Revelation is a profound symbol of the impending doom of the Antichrist. But what does it really mean? In this context, the supper of the great God isn't a feast of celebration, but a somber forecast of the carnage to come. The birds are invited to feast not on the bounty of the earth, but on the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses and their riders and all people, both free and slave, small and great. This is a vivid depiction of the aftermath of the great battle of Armageddon, the final confrontation between the forces of good and evil. But who are these people whose flesh will be devoured by the birds? They represent the armies that the Antichrist will gather to fight against Christ, the Antichrist, in his arrogance and delusion, will rally nations to his side, believing he can stand against the divine power of Christ. Kings, captains, mighty men, and all peoples, regardless of their status in society, will be swayed by the Antichrist's deception and will join him in his feudal war against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The phrase Supper of the Great God is a stark reminder that those who align with the forces of darkness will meet a tragic end. Despite their power, prestige, and numbers, they are doomed to be defeated and devoured. The Antichrist, with all his false promises and deceitful miracles, will lead them not to victory, but to their downfall. But in this grim prediction, there is also hope. It assures us that no matter how powerful evil seems, it cannot prevail against the might of the divine. The Antichrist, despite his grand ambitions and temporary reign of terror, is destined for defeat. His armies, no matter how vast, will be struck down. His reign of deception and destruction will be ended by the righteous judgment of Christ. But despite all his efforts the Antichrist is destined for failure. This is the sobering message of the Supper of the Great God. It's a reminder of the ultimate triumph of good over evil, of truth over deception, and of the divine over the worldly. Opening. The Antichrist, the false prophet and their armies gather to make war against Christ and his army. As the final battle of this earthly saga unfolds, the Antichrist rallies his forces, 
a formidable assembly of nations, all deceived by his false promises of power and prosperity. They stand ready to wage war against the heavenly host, a war they are destined to lose. The Antichrist, the false prophet and their armies stand against Christ and his army. The very air seems to hold its breath, as the two forces face each other, the tension palpable. But as the scriptures foretold, this battle is not won by earthly might or power but by the word of God. Suddenly the heavens open, and the full force of divine justice is unleashed. The Antichrist and the false prophet, the puppet masters of this grand deception, are captured. Their reign of terror and deception is brought to a swift and decisive end. The heavenly host stands triumphant, and in a moment that echoes through eternity, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. No earthly fire but a divine flame, a symbol of eternal judgment and a final destination for all who oppose the will of the Almighty. This is not the cinematic climax of any human story, but the righteous judgment of God himself. The Antichrist, who once seemed invincible, meets his inevitable fate, not through a heroic deed or a climactic battle, but through the divine judgment of Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In this moment, the false dominion of the Antichrist is shattered, his power stripped away, his followers scattered, his lies and deceit are laid bare for all to see, his reign of terror once a seemingly unstoppable force, is reduced to ashes in the face of divine truth. And so, the reign of the Antichrist comes to a fiery end. The false prophet and the Antichrist, once figures of awe and fear, are no more than memories, a stark reminder of the destructive power of deception, and the ultimate victory of truth over lies. The rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. The aftermath of this great battle, this war of Armageddon, was not a sight for the faint of heart. The battleground was strewn with the fallen, the followers of the Antichrist who had gathered to oppose the King of Kings. These were individuals marked by the beast, those who had made their allegiance clear, choosing to stand against the one true God. This was not a physical mark, but a spiritual one symbolizing their rejection of truth, their embrace of deception. It was a mark of their heart's condition, their decision to align with darkness rather than light. The consequence of this choice was devastating. As the dust settled on the battlefield, the fate of those who bore the mark of the beast became clear. They had not only lost the battle, but their very lives. The sword that proceeded from the mouth of the one who sat on the horse, this powerful symbol of divine judgment, had struck them down. The very word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, had proven its power once again. It was not a physical sword that ended their lives, but the truth, the righteous judgment of the King of Kings. Their bodies lay scattered across the battlefield, a gruesome feast for the birds of the air. The scripture paints a vivid picture of this scene, a testament to the ultimate fate of those who choose to oppose God's kingdom. The scripture says, And all the birds were filled with their flesh, a chilling reminder of the consequences of aligning with the forces of darkness. But let us not forget, this is not a tale of despair, but one of victory. A victory of light over darkness, truth over deception, love over hate. This is the final act in the divine drama, where the Antichrist's reign of terror is brought to a decisive end. In the end, all the birds were filled with their flesh, marking the end of the Antichrist's reign. It is a stark reminder that those who stand against the true king will not prevail, that in the end righteousness will always triumph over evil. So, how will the Antichrist die? He will not. This is the stark reality we grapple with, the profound mystery that has circulated through the ages. We've journeyed through the narrative of the Antichrist's rise and subsequent fall, unraveling the tale of his eventual defeat. His reign, marked by deceit and false prophecy, will be abruptly terminated by none other than Christ himself. Yet, in an unexpected twist, the Antichrist will not meet his end in death. Instead, he will be cast into the lake of fire, a fate arguably more severe and enduring. Engulfed in eternal flames, he will be eternally separated from the world he once sought to rule. This chilling end serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of defiance against divinity. In the grand scheme of the universe, the Antichrist's reign is but a fleeting moment, a brief disturbance in the eternal reign of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords.